This episode is brought to you by StoryWorth, the perfect Father's Day gift. For $20 off, visit storyworth.com slash gems when you subscribe. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, my friend, and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 229. Since you're listening to this show, you probably enjoy researching your family's stories. Have you thought about telling the story of your own personal history? Most of us have at some point, but let's be honest. Continuing the genealogical research of our ancestors probably seems more appealing. (laughs) And frankly, it's probably easier than sitting down and figuring out how to capture our own story. I've spoken to a lot of genealogists through the years, and I often hear comments like, "Ah, my story isn't all that interesting or important, but nothing could be farther from the truth. When we don't tell our own story, we not only take a big risk that the memory of our life will eventually be lost down the generations, but we rob our family and our community of an important piece of their history. Karen Dustman is the author of the book, Writing a Memoir, From Stuck to Finished. She's been helping folks capture and record their stories for several years in her community in the Sierra Nevada, which spans central and eastern California and goes into western Nevada. She's known widely there as a local historian, writing on her blog and in the local newspaper about the history of the area. It was Karen's story of the history of not a family, but an old house in the Carson Valley that shed light on the fact that one of its prior inhabitants was at risk of being forgotten. And no one wants to be forgotten. In this episode, we're going to explore the life and death of 10-year-old Roy Thran, how his story tentatively made its way through the generations of the family in one simple box to the hands of his great-grandniece, Krista Jenkins. It was Krista who connected the all-important dots, eventually culminating in a wonderful museum exhibit that is now telling an important part of the Carson Valley history and touching the lives of its residents. Stay with me, because we're going to travel back to 1925 to a sparsely populated ranching community to hear the story of Roy Thran and his family and how it's being shared today. My hope is that Roy's story will transform your thinking about sharing your own story. Last fall, Krista Jenkins stumbled upon an article featuring a house that she knew well. It was the home her grandmother grew up in, a beautiful two-story home nestled on a ranch in Gardnerville, Nevada, about an hour south of her home in Reno. The blog post, called The Tale of the Thran House and an Old Trunk, was written by Karen Dustman, a local area historian and author. It featured the story of Dick and Marie Thran, German immigrants who came to the Carson Valley in the late 19th century, and the four children they raised there, including Krista's grandmother Marie. What jumps out at many readers about the blog post is the photograph of the beautifully restored German steamer trunk, complete with heavy black ornate hardware, very likely the trunk that Krista's great-grandmother traveled with from the old country. The trunk had been discovered by the current owners in an old shed on the property, dirty and filled with auto parts. But for Krista Jenkins, what jumped out at her was what was missing from the story. 
a little boy named Roy, the fifth and surviving Thran child. Author Karen Dustman explains how the two women connected. I'd mentioned the names of four of the surviving children of this couple who lived in this house, but this relative reached out to me and said, did you know that there was actually another child that they had named Roy? I was really curious, so we got in touch, and she told me not only about Roy and his life, but also that she had this amazing box. The family had kept this little boy's possessions all these years after he died, and she'd become the custodian of this box. So she asked if I'd like to see it, and of course I wanted to see it. The box contained the young Roy Thran's childhood, a time capsule of sorts filled with the books, toys, and trinkets representing his interests and activities. In a sense, it was a boy in a box. Coming up next, we travel back to 1925 and the birth and death of Roy Thran. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Roy Thran was born Wednesday, June 10th of 1925. The folks in the Carson Valley of Nevada were flocking to the new Tom Mix film, North of Hudson Bay. It was playing at the Rex Theater in town. And everyone was looking forward to the big Carson Valley Day dance to be held that Saturday night at the CVIC Hall in Minden. Everyone, that is, except Anna Sophia Marie Thran, known fondly as Marie. A native of Hanover, Germany, Marie was in the last weeks of her pregnancy and was happy to deliver before the hot summer weather was in full swing. She had reason to be apprehensive about this birth for several reasons. A 48-year-old mother of four, she was on borrowed maternity time with this late arrival. Her last surviving child had been born in 1901, and since then she'd suffered the loss of three more children including little Katie Freda, who lived just three months. Marie's husband, Dietrich Hermann Thrawn, known around town as Dick, was 14 years her senior. Also a native of Hanover, Germany, according to the 1900 census, Dick had immigrated in 1881, and he became a naturalized citizen. He saved his money as he worked hard for the local area ranchers, and at the age of 30, he returned to Germany to find himself a wife. In 1895, he returned with seven other Germans and, most importantly, the beautiful Anna Sophia Maria Dykoff, his fiancée, on his arm. Within the month, they exchanged vows at the home of Dietrich's brother, Hermann. Now, that was back on another lovely June day, the 29th of June, 1895, on which the hardworking Dick presented Maria with a lavish wedding gift, a beautiful horse and buggy. Lying there in her bed in the enchanting white two-story home on Dressler Lane, which was fashioned after the grand homes of their native land, Marie gave birth to their son in 1925. 
author and local Carson Valley historian, Karen Dustman. Roy's birth must have been quite a surprise for Roy, especially after losing three children in the intervening years. I'm guessing it was a very happy surprise, this very late in life baby, and he was certainly welcomed into the family. They had a christening ceremony for him at the local Lutheran church on June 21st of 1925, so 11 days after he was born. Throne descendant, Krista Jenkins. Because Roy was a late baby, my great-grandmother, you know, coveted this little guy. It was their joy of their life at this point. Roy grew up like many sons in the Carson Valley at that time, likely carrying some responsibilities around the ranch, but also living a fairly free-range life. Historian Karen Dustman explains. Roy was, of course, born in the, and grew up in the late 1920s and the early 1930s, so uh, he would have been part of a wonderful rural farming community here. And, of course, he would have lived in that beautiful Theron house on his parents' Jerry's ranch. And both of his parents, of course, were Germans, as we've talked about, from the old country. So I would imagine they were a little bit strict, and I would imagine he would have had chores to do on the ranch. But as the baby of the family, I'm picturing him doing less than the other kids in terms of chores. Uh, he went to the elementary school in Minden nearby, where he would have gotten to know all the other ranchers' kids. In the Thran family, a few handed down stories confirm this. It was your typical ranching family in the early 1900s where everybody pitched in and worked. And um, little Roy came along and, you know, he was handed down the little toys that somebody else had in the family. And um, some descriptions that we've been told, as far as my generation, is that he was just a happy-go-lucky little kid and liked to pitch in and work and um, very, just very kind of a jolly, good good little guy got relatively good grades in school and you know was conscientious and just kind of the love of my great grandmother and grandfather's life at that point but it's really the box of Roy's possessions that tell us a more complete story of his childhood he had those classic metal toy trucks to play with and watercolor paints we know that he played diddlywinks with his friends and marbles one of the other things that he had as an item in his box was a homemade slingshot that somebody had carved out of a fork branch. So I can picture him out there trying to hit things with the slingshot. Uh, we know that he played baseball, and someone had carved, hand-carved a wooden baseball bat for him, if you can imagine. It was not even perfectly round. There were at least like flat sides on the baseball bat, so you can imagine it must have been really hard to hit the ball in a straight line. And then one of his sweetest possessions that I really like is he had a stuffed toy rabbit that he must have carried around as a toddler and it looks like one of those homemade things like women back then used to um, buy a printed pattern that was on cotton cloth and they'd cut it out and they'd stuff it the moms would sew around the edges and put stuffing inside and this was a really stained and kind of a well-worn toy so I just picture him carrying around this little stuffed rabbit as a child. Roy was also enamored with the great aviators of the day. He joined the Jimmy Allen Flying Club for kids, which came with an official acceptance letter, a bronze pin featuring flying cadet wings, and a silver pilot's bracelet. Are you Mr. Thompson? Yeah, yeah. You must be Jimmy Allen. Oh, I'm glad to have you here, Allen. Let me introduce our chief engineer, Bill Whitehead. I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Whitehead. I can't make any promises about winning a race. Too many things can happen between the start and the finish. But I can promise you two things. I'll work day and night and give you everything I have. Well, that's all anyone can expect. What's the other promise? That I'll fly a fair and square race. If I can't win that way, I don't want to win at all. I'm putting my money on Jimmy Allen to come through. In the box was also a treasured pint-sized version of the aviator cap that Charles Lindbergh wore on his history-making solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean in 1927. 
One day in 1935, 10-year-old Roy entered the kitchen where his mother was working. But this was no ordinary day. Well, the story in the family is that um, my great-grandmother was in the kitchen along with my grandmother. And little Roy walked in and my great-grandmother kind of shrieked a little bit and written across his forehead was something in the order of, I won't be here much longer. Sometime after this very unusual event, early on the afternoon of August 6, 1935, Roy headed over to his friend, Henry Cordes' home, to pick up some Sunday school papers that he'd left in the car. While visiting, Roy and Henry's older brother, 12-year-old Roy Cordes, decided to head out on horseback for a ride. Around 4 o'clock, they stopped to eat lunch, and even though, by all accounts, from the family, Roy hated water, they decided to make their way to the dam on the Carson River to go swimming. According to Roy Cordes' account of the event to the local newspaper, quote, After undressing, Roy Cordes admonished his chum to be careful because the water near the dam was deep. The words were hardly out of his mouth when his chum stepped into the deep water and disappeared. Neither of the boys could swim, but young Cordes made a heroic attempt to save his companion and came within an ace of losing his own life as he frantically grabbed for his chum. Realizing that he was helpless to save his friend, young Cordes hurriedly dressed, mounted his horse, and rode at top speed to the home of his father and notified him of the tragic event. Mr. Cordes drove to the Thran Ranch, telling the parents of the boys what had happened. Subsequently, my uncle, which would be Roy's brother, Carl, jumped in, and he's the one that found Roy's body. And they pulled it out on the bank and tried CPR for quite a while, and you know, it wasn't working, so he, he passed away there. But Roy's brother Carl is the one that drug him out. Coming up next, the path that Roy's possessions took after his untimely death and how his story is pulling together a community. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And my heritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. After Roy's tragic death, Roy's mother, Marie, carefully collected not only his prized possessions, like the aviator's cap and a much-loved and worn stuffed rabbit toy, but also some of the things that he would have recently used, like his school slate and a small collection of books. They were placed in a box, and by all accounts from the family, Roy was not spoken of again. That is, until years and generations later. When my grandmother Marie's brother died, who was Carl, who was also the brother of Roy, um, he died in the early 80s, I believe. My grandmother was in the family house, and they were cleaning out, you know, the belongings in this house, and that's where she was raised, and of course Carl was also, and Roy. And in the back portion of my great-grandmother's closet was this box. And my mom was there along with my aunt, and my grandmother came out of this 
closet area, and, and we don't know why, gave this box to my mother and with the instructions of make sure Krista gets this box. And so, you know, they went on about their business. And then my mom, whenever we got together shortly after that, my mom said, oh, I have something from you from, from Grandma. So it was this box, and we started going through it. And at that time, I didn't know that little Roy had ever existed. In such a short period of time, one leaf on the family tree had grown dangerously close to being forgotten. And Krista learned very quickly how important it was to gather the stories of her elders. You know, as, as time went on, the, the, the funny thing is, and, and maybe this is what happens in these prior generations, is, you know, nobody really talked about Roy. In fact, I just read an article that my grandma was interviewed in a long time ago, and she spoke of growing up and working on the ranch and all this stuff, and there was, she didn't even mention Roy. So you know, it's just maybe, maybe that generation is just, you know, he passed away and they just parked him. Or, you know, it's, again, it's speculation. Maybe that was a, such a traumatic event for the family that they just decided to park it. You know, that, that could be a generational thing that long ago. But, you know, it's not like, oh, you know, talk about Roy. And it just was never really brought up. The box sat for years in my mom's uh, closet. So, you know, he kind of got shoved back into another closet. We started going through all his his belongings and we kind of pieced together the story. And that's when we kind of started figuring out, oh, my God, this my mom remembered because she was told the story as a little girl growing up that these were Roy's belongings. Over the years, Krista kept the box, and she gathered the remaining family stories about Roy, really restoring him to the family tree. So on the day that she came across Karen Dustman's article about the family house, she seized the opportunity to restore him to the community's history. She was wanting to know if I would be willing to write a story about Roy and his box and also whether our local museum might be interested in maybe doing an exhibit of his things. So we arranged to meet up at the museum with the museum curator and thankfully Gail is wonderful. She was as excited and thrilled as I was about the box and I said I would of course love to do a follow-up story about Roy and his box and Gail welcomed the idea of an exhibit for the museum and made the arrangements and the space for it to happen. Taking items on loan rather than as a donation was a fairly rare occurrence for the Carson Valley Museum. But museum curator Gail Allen felt it was worth a closer look. And Douglas County Historical Society trustee Frank Dressel wholeheartedly agreed. Krista brought the box in and they kind of analyzed the different things, the different artifacts of Roy's um, as far as with his childhood, the stuff that was in the box that they found in the attic. And um, it just... It, like, you know, it's a local story. Um, it It's a great story. You know, the box has all kinds of treasures as far as this life of Roy Thrawn. And as I started bringing stuff out of this box, everybody was enamored. They were just like, oh, my God. And it, you know, it just kind of fell into place. And they weren't ready to donate to the museum. And, you know, the big thing about the museum is that, you know, we don't like to take things on loan you know, because of the responsibility and everything else. But with this, it was being a local exhibit. And so what we decided to do was to have it on exhibit at the museum for a year. Krista and her aunt, um, Lois Ron, worked together to assemble the exhibit and physically put it in place. There was also a, a curator who was really, really helpful. And she involved an exhibit coordinator to help get the display cases arranged and you know, do what he could, but really it was the two family members who put the display together and did a beautiful job. Uh, they have two tall glass cases devoted just to his exhibit, which is really a tremendous amount of space. Um, and it's this little snapshot in time of just amazing things that people who've come to look at it have just been so uh, impressed with the exhibit. They did a beautiful job of it. My uh, aunt, who's my mother's sister, her name is Lois Thrawn. She had a florist business for a long time. In fact, it's still in the family. Her granddaughter is running it now. And so my aunt just does, she's really good at putting things together. You know, I can put stuff on a shelf, but uh, my aunt kind of has that ability to design. Uh, and my mom lives in Reno, and, you know, I asked my aunt, and she's like, yeah, I'll help you. 
So, you know, we'd put stuff there and then she'd go behind and she'd rearrange it and she'd look, stop and look at it and rearrange it. So we just didn't put stuff on a shelf. My aunt just kept moving things around and moving things around and um, it, it, it just had some continuity and, I, you know, that's why we kind of drug her along. That and the fact that, um, you know, this was her uncle, really, and um, she got to participate in his story, too. Roy's story was quickly becoming the family's and the community's story. His childhood possessions are transforming how people think about the importance of the story of every life, even one that spanned only a decade. The exhibit drives home the idea that everyone's story is important and really connected to everyone else's story. You can just hear the enthusiasm in Frank Dressel's voice as he describes and connects with the items that were so precious to Roy Thran. Well, you know, the, the big thing that caught me was uh, the handwritten letter to his friend, looking forward to him visiting over the summer, vacation and such. Um, it just, you know, just that, that's how they communicated back then. You could just tell that, you know, he was so excited about his friend coming to visit for the summertime. You know, the way kids are raised today with cell phones and everything like that, th- this boy didn't have any of that back then. I mean, it just shows the lifestyle here in the Carson Valley. This is such a small community and, um, you know, life as we know it is changing on a daily basis and the old timers are, they're leaving us and it's important, I think, that we don't lose sight of history of our own families or history of an area that you're living in. I was really touched that the family wanted Roy's story to be told, and I was just really pleased that I was able to share his story and put that up on my blog. But the really big contribution was by the family coming forward and sharing his story. I just thought it was neat that this tragic event ultimately had a really positive outcome. Coming up next, we'll visit with author Karen Dustman and hear her strategies for how you can tell your own story. Okay, so I want to let you know that the folks at StoryWorth, they've accomplished a staggering feat. (laughs) They got my dad to tell me his stories. You know, I've never known that much about my dad's life. He's a man of few words, and that especially applies to stories about his life. So for Father's Day, it was about two years ago, I got him a story worth subscription. So what they did was every week, they emailed him a question about his life. And I got to see which questions were coming up so I could have some input on which ones I wanted to ask or if I wanted to change up the questions. He replied to the emails, and I received copies of his replies. Now, he could have also recorded his answers by calling the StoryWorth number as well, but he liked the emailing. So his answers were fairly short, and that's just the way he communicates. But I got to tell you, I have learned so much more about him in the past couple of years than I probably have over my entire lifetime. And as someone who cares about privacy and security, I appreciate knowing that this interaction is only for us. StoryWorth lets us stay in control of who actually sees his stories. And at the end of the year, after he answered all the questions, we ordered the keepsake hardcover book that comes with the subscription. It compiled all of his answers into one volume, and we were able to upload old family photos easily by email, on the web, and through their app. We continue to enjoy this book, and I know it's going to get passed on down to my daughters and my grandchildren for sure. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that this episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. And as you know, I only work with the sponsors I genuinely believe in and that I use myself. Well, this Father's Day, you can get $20 off when you subscribe to StoryWorth by visiting storyworth.com slash gems. Get a gift for your dad or How about for your son or your son-in-law to help them start preserving and sharing their memories with their children? StoryWorth is going to give that dad a reason to spend time with his favorite memories and share them with you and the whole family, giving you all opportunities to become closer. It's an easy and thoughtful Father's Day gift, even at the last minute. So for $20 off, visit storyworth.com slash gems when you subscribe. That's $20 off at storyworth.com slash gems. The 
The Roy Thran exhibit at the Carson Valley Historical Society Museum is a wonderful example that every single person's life is made up of stories that need to be told, no matter whether the person is famous or how short that life may have been. And that's because our stories are connected to the stories of the other people who are connected to us, both our family and our community. The time to tell our stories is now. I mean, let's face it, we're not getting any younger. And if we tell these stories ourselves, rather than leave it to somebody else after we're gone, they won't be at risk of being inaccurate or worse yet, not told at all. Now, you heard from author Karen Dustman in the first half of this episode. She's helped many people tell their own stories and write their memoirs. So let's go back and chat with her a little bit more about just how to do this and most importantly, how to get started. I know that you have written a book. It's called Writing a Memoir from Stuck to Finished. And I'm guessing that writing a book like this is is a way of helping people get their stories out and kind of, I would imagine, also reflect on the impact that they do have in whatever small or big way that they do. Tell us a little bit about what initially prompted you to write the book and what you're hoping people will get out of it. So I wrote the book about writing a memoir, um, I guess as a way to share my experiences with trying to do that. Um, I've always been really passionate about preserving family history and oral history. Ever since I was pretty young, uh, I started collecting little bits and pieces of oral history from my aunt and my uncle and my father, and I made sure I wrote it all down. But the real motivating force for me in writing the book was that my mom died very suddenly and unexpectedly. She was only 74 years old. I always just assumed I was going to have so much more time with her. There was lots of time to get her stories. And I know lots of people have that same experience, unfortunately. When people go, especially when they go really suddenly, you always think, oh, I wish I could have asked her this. I wish I could have asked her that. There were so many questions that I still have. And over the years, I've taught like memoir writing classes and helped other people to collect personal oral histories. So the point of the book initially was to try to distill what I'd learned and to share the best advice that I could with other people and make it simple and approachable. But I also wanted to really offer encouragement because it's a really daunting task to think about writing your memoir. Um, it's, a, it's a big box to open. And so I wanted to tell people, you can do this. Um, here, here's the best way to go about it that I know, and I really wanted people to know they can do it, and it's important. Don't wait. That was the experience that made me think, I really want to share this to encourage people to get it done while you can. Now, you say in the book that everyone has great stories to tell. What do you say to somebody who says, well, Karen, I'm I'm going through this and I'm starting to write, but I don't feel like I, I have great stories to tell. How do you help them find them and identify them? Because sometimes we don't even see them. You're right. A lot of people say my story is not that important. Um, I don't know where to start. I don't have any good stories that anybody else will want to know or I want to share. So there's kind of two things. One is think about what message you really want to leave with people, what stories you really want people to know about. Is there anything you really do want to share? Uh, We just did an oral history with uh, someone nearby here who was in her 90s, and she sort of grew up in a farming community and didn't think of her life as being that special, and yet we asked her how she met her husband. And that's the kind of story the family always wants to know, and she was so excited to share it. And it was a really touching, lovely story about how they met. And she was actually the one who kind of initiated the contact with him, and she was so shy. And she said in this very sweet way, she knew this was her chance to go up to him and say hello. And so she did, and the romance started from there. It was a really great story. So some of those kinds of stories are very fun to share. And then if you really don't know where to go, but you kind of think maybe you might have something somebody else wants to know, involve a second person and have them ask you questions um, a daughter or a son or a niece or a nephew or even somebody from outside and say, you know, what would you like to know about my life? Um, and let them kind of prompt the story. Sometimes that will bring other things out. Like this particular woman would never have told her story except that we were asking her questions. So Sometimes that can be helpful. Now, I know when I speak to different groups, and I've been doing it for about a dozen years now, it took me a long time to start sharing more personal stories, even small ways as they kind of fit in different genealogy presentations I've done. I was kind of surprised the first time I did it because I was very candid in the story. And the response was intense. So there's, there's something about when we are vulnerable ourselves, 
that helps kind of break down barriers very quickly and helps bring out stories and responses from other people. But it's also can be healing to ourselves because we realize, wow, here I've chewed my nails up about this worrying. And, and when I did it, all these great things happen. And I actually realize it's, it's not as bad as maybe I've had it in my head all these years. Why do you think that is so healing in many ways? And how in what ways have you seen it be healing? Great question. Um, just telling the family story can be so healing for a couple of reasons. One is that you're recounting a story now at this point in time, so you have a chance to look back and put it a little bit in perspective. So maybe something bad or uncomfortable happened to you or to someone in your family years ago. If you're writing about it now, you get a chance to bring it all into the perspective of the years you've had in between. You get to hopefully make more sense of what happened, and that can be very freeing. Um, And I think just as in Roy's story, I think as time passes, the sweetness sort of comes out. So there's a little bit of the pain that's faded, and you get a chance to look back and say, there were good things that happened then too, and you get to look at those good things and remember them. So like in Roy's story, he had butterflies in his book. I mean, they were beautiful. He had wonderful days out there um, in the fields doing fun things as a little boy. So um, I think that can be healing, to remember it's not just that one tragic event that happened but a whole lifetime that happened as well. Um, And in Roy's case, the family found a way literally to take the monsters out of the closet. They were able to take all that bottled up grief and find a way to celebrate his life and to share his life with other people. And it felt like it was um, kind of a sigh of relief. They um, were able to come together as a family and make that exhibit happen. And they were able to get that box out of the closet and to share it with the community. There's a lot of power in telling the stories, even the stories that hurt. Um, the bad things don't get to control us anymore. Karen, what are the most common roadblocks or stumbling blocks that people face when they start thinking about writing down their family's story or maybe their own personal story? What do you hear that people struggle with and what do you tell them? I hear a couple of things from people who are starting to write their family stories or starting to write their memoir about places where they feel like they get stuck. Or The first one is, where do I start telling my story? Uh, and I know it's a really intimidating task if you think about you're trying to produce an entire work here or a, a book about your life. It just can feel overwhelming. So I always tell people to find a comfortable story to begin. Find one single story that you're really excited about, hopefully a happy story. It's usually easier to approach those than the sad ones. But find one story that you really want to tell and start there. That can help make the scope a little smaller. So you're dealing with one one concept, one story, one episode Uh, one vignette instead of your whole life, and you can break it down a little bit. So hopefully you'll finish that one story and keep going. And then the other stumbling blocks that people often have are sort of the practical ones, like how do you get your story down on paper if you don't type well, or how are you going to um, get a parent to talk when the parent doesn't want to talk in front of a microphone? What are the mechanical difficulties of kind of getting it captured? And of course, there are all sorts of ways around that. There's dictation software like Dragon. There's transcription services available. Um, Sometimes if someone's afraid of a microphone, you can just ask if it would make them more comfortable if you could put it off to the side a little bit and it's out of their viewpoint. I mean, you don't want to surreptitiously be tape recording them, but sometimes just having it away from their line of sight can be really helpful and get people to open up. There are lots of ways around it, but the important thing is to just keep trying, keep poking around until you find a solution that works for you. It's just so important to capture those stories while you still have family around who can tell them. So um, start where you can and don't look for perfect. Just try to get it down as best you can and at least you've captured some of it. I want to talk about how important it is that people actually picture the words flowing freely for themselves and seeing it happening. The, The first chapter of my book was about getting your mental game in gear and just knowing that you can accomplish whatever you set out to accomplish in writing a book. It is possible. You've got to think about it and decide that you really can do it. And one of the things that's really helpful and that I recommend to my readers is to rehearse it in your mind, see it happening, and picture it happening well and the words flowing freely. I think that really can open up your your writing ability just to imagine that you're not going to have problems. You're going to have a good time doing this. This is going to be good. It's going to go well. And then I also want to encourage people to reach out for help and encouragement. Um, Don't leave your stories untold. That was the biggest thing from my lesson with my mom is don't think you're always going to have time later to get your stories down on paper or to capture your relative's stories. Do it now because there's really no legacy you can leave that's more important than that. 
I know that in speaking to genealogists around the country, it really is a mental game, if you will. The idea of getting personal and telling your own story and feeling like that you can do that and put it down on paper. And it's uh, far more a struggle in their own mind. But once you get going and just start doing the doing, then it can flow, you know, and so it, it's almost like just acknowledge it. And, and like you said, envision it being a positive experience and then uh, go ahead and just do it anyway. <laughs> and Nobody's and you judging. Share, you talked about sharing with other people in your conferences and seminars and stuff. I think if you can share a little piece of your writing, if you're comfortable doing that, if you're mm-hmm. able to do that, if you can share a little piece or a little story that can give you encouragement too, because you will get such tremendous feedback from people. Um, you know, your family will be so happy that you did this. And hopefully that will give you some motivation to keep going as well. This is not the only book you've written. And of course, the book we're talking about is writing a memoir from stuck to finish. You have several books and you have different kinds of books. And all of them are under your uh, Claritage Press. Tell us a little bit why you started Claritage Press and some of the books that you have published. Claritage Press kind of came into being in a really special way for me. I had written several books before, as you'd mentioned, and I had written uh, other books that had been commercially published, more traditionally published, but I was wanting to write a book about Silver Mountain City, which was a Comstock-era ghost town near where I live, and it was basically a history of this tiny little unknown place in the tiniest county in California. So I knew it was not going to be a big market. This was a tiny little niche market topic, and no big publisher was ever going to be interested in this book, so I decided I was going to self-publish it. And my mother had died, uh, as I'd mentioned, about nine years earlier, and her name was Claire, and she would have absolutely loved this historical book. So I was kind of looking for a way to honor her because she was really passionate in her own way about preserving history. And so I decided to name my publishing company Claritage, which is a blend of her name, Claire, and the word heritage. And I felt like that really said what I was all about. I'm about preserving history and honoring family. So since then, I've been very fortunate. Claritage has grown and grown and I was counting the books up before we talked today, and I think we're up to about 10 local history books of various kinds, and I've done about 15 or 20 individual family histories now, which are very, very special to me. It's just so important to preserve those stories. My mother, Claire, would have loved the history. She would have loved the books, and you know, she really would have loved Roy Thron's story, too, by the way. She was born in 1927, so that was about two years after Roy. And so they would have grown up in basically the same era. And I picture her, I think she played tiddlywinks too. I know we had those when I was a kid. So I picture her having a lot in common with his story. Well, thank you so much again, Karen Dustman. She's the author of writing a memoir from stuck to finish. And Karen, before I let you go, tell everybody how they can find your blog. Okay. Uh, my blog is available on claritage.com. It's spelled C-L-A-I-R-I-T-A-G-E.com. And there's a little tab at the top that says blog. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Genealogy Gems podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, as we wrap up this episode 230 of the Genealogy Gems podcast, I think I'm sufficiently recovered from my jet lag from my recent trip to England to tell you a little bit about the brand new conference, a new genealogy conference that I keynoted over there. It was called The Genealogy Show, and it was held at the NEC in Birmingham, England. Now, this was the same location where they held Who Do You Think You Are Live? Uh, Originally, it started in London. It moved up to Birmingham, and it's a terrific venue. Of course, Who Do You Think You Are Live? has folded as a conference, but The Genealogy Show has kind of stepped in to take its place, and they had a a great success. Hundreds and hundreds of people attended this year, and Kirsty Gray and her board members, including Dear Myrtle here in America, um, I hear are already planning the next conference. So you might want to mark your calendars, June 26th and 27th of 2020 in Birmingham, England. Now, Bill came along with me on this trip. We spent about a week um, prior to the conference in Derbyshire, and then we wrapped things up for the two-day event. It was June 7th and 8th of 2019, this year. We met up with lots of new folks and some old friends, including one you'll know, Nathan Dylan Goodwin. Now, you first heard from Nathan here on the Genealogy Gems podcast in premium episode number 124. 
And that was when he talked about his book, The Lost Ancestor. And most recently, we had him on the show, the premium podcast, uh, episode 159, about his, it was kind of two books within a book. It was called The Wicked Trade and The Suffragette Secret. I know many of you have read Nathan's books. And he's such a delight. It's been wonderful to have him here on the show. And of course, we always love being able to get together when we're in person at conferences. So uh, I got a chance this time to actually sit in on one of his presentations. And it was called Novelizing Intrigues in Genealogy, The Journey and Process of Writing Genealogical Crime Mystery Stories. Now, I picked up a couple of little tidbits, so I'll share those with you that I heard uh, in that presentation, which was a lot of fun, kind of hearing about his process, how he got started, uh, and how it all kind of comes together. He said he originally planned to kill off his leading character, Morton Farrier. I know many of you will be familiar with Morton. When he first wrote about Morton Farrier, he was taking a, a creative writing class, I believe, at university, and the, his fellow students talked him out of it. <laughs> but thank goodness, right? Because Morton Farrier went on to be featured in so many of his books, and I know we will see him again in future books. So uh, we're all thankful for that. I think Nathan is too, actually. And he said that he typically works about three books ahead. So, hey, we've got lots to look forward to here from Nathan Dillon Goodwin. I also ran into Doug Elms. He's the president of the Victoria Gum, which is an association of genealogists using microcomputers in Australia, hence the GUM acronym. And it's always fun to see him. I first met Doug out at Sydney when I keynoted the Australasian conference in Sydney, Australia last year. So we got a chance to catch up. I know that his organization has been taking advantage of our society package and getting our videos out in front of his members. So we love being able to reach people wherever they are. And okay, so I met some new friends, Jenny and Michelle. Hi, Jenny and Michelle. Hi, I'm waving at you. These two ladies were waiting for me at the entrance of my first session, which was time travel with Google Earth. They were just a delight. They were so enthusiastic. They've been longtime listeners. And in fact, when I got home, I had an email in my inbox. I want to read you part of it. Uh, She sent the photograph that we took, of course, the three of us together. And Michelle says, it was so, so lovely to actually meet you at last. My friend Jenny and I are addicted to your website, podcasts, and all you teach. And as we said at the show, we are postgraduate diploma students at Strath, which is the genealogy program at the University of Strathclyde, which is absolutely um, renowned for its genealogy program. So she says they're diploma students there, and whenever we get stuck, we say, what would Lisa do? (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's kind of scary, isn't it? No, that's really nice. She says, we are thrilled that you came over to the UK, and any chance we get, we spread the word. Um, She says, your UK number one fan. Okay, it's official. Michelle is the UK number one fan. Thank you, Michelle and Jenny. It was so nice to meet you both. You guys are delightful. You'll see our photograph in the show notes for this episode. And I, of course, stopped by the My Heritage booth, which I always do. Uh, got to see Daniel Horowitz there, and he had Lorna Maloney helping him out. And if you're an avid podcast lister of Genealogy Podcast, you probably are familiar with that name, particularly if you have Irish ancestors, because Lorna Maloney is the owner of Merriman Research, and she's the producer and the host of the Genealogy Radio Show which airs from Kilkey, Ireland on a weekly basis uh, on Thursdays at 4 p.m. You can hear it in Ireland. And of course, you can hear it as a recorded podcast in all the major podcasting apps. So what a delight she was. And what a delight she was. We actually snuck away to the speaker's lounge that they had for us at the conference, and we did some recording. So I am going to be on the Genealogy Radio Show, helping them celebrate a big anniversary that they have. She's been at this for, gosh, about five years, I believe. And then we recorded an interview, kind of reversing the roles, and I'm going to have her on this show. And we talked about Irish research. Um, She is absolutely a gem when it comes to Irish research. And I'm very excited to have you hear her. I'm hoping that will be in the July 2019 episode, the next episode we have. Uh, Should be number 231. And Bill and I celebrated a very important vital record that we generated 35 years ago, our marriage. (laughs) 
June 9th is our anniversary. And we ended up flying home on the actual anniversary, but we spent a week celebrating in Derbyshire. Like I said, prior to the conference, we flew into London, drove up to Derbyshire. I was so proud of him. We rented a car and he drove on the left side of the road the whole time. And, you know, in Southern England, that's not so bad because we were on the freeways and it's basically like a freeway or a highway. But you get up the uh, the M4, the M6, or whichever M it was, and a couple hours later, you're in Derbyshire, which is glorious. But every day we got out of the car at the end of the day, I felt like I was leaving an amusement park, like we'd been riding roller coasters all day. Derbyshire is glorious and beautiful, really unspoiled, has a huge national park in the middle of it. But the roads are tiny. And in fact, uh, we stayed at Dana Farm, which... I will just recommend to you because it is wonderful. It is a beautiful little bed and breakfast up one of these hills of all the pasture farm land. And you drive in a one lane road. Of course, there's rock walls everywhere. They had to pull the rocks out of the ground and you know stack them up. And that's how they kind of line the roads, which of course then get the vines and the flowers growing on them. So you really can't hardly see as you're driving up these zigzagging one lane roads to get to the top of this hill, this hill is the best word, the top of the valley where uh, the bed and breakfast was. But it's terrifying because every turn you have no idea if there's a car coming the other direction. And so it became all about getting to know where the little pullouts were, you know, so you could move aside and, and pass each other. And we managed not to hit anybody, which was amazing. But I can tell you, jumping ahead in the story, our last night in Windsor, we just kind of walked around Windsor for a couple of hours before we went to Heathrow Airport. A bike rider hit us, <laughs> which which was scary. He bounced right up, this Italian man, and went, no, no, no problem, I'm fine. And he took off, but... um we had pulled into a parking lot and we were stopped and we'd been there for a couple seconds and he just plowed right into us. I don't know if he was on his phone or what he was doing, but it's kind of scary, but he was fine. Uh, but it was almost comical. That happened down in Windsor when we had just been on pins and needles, holding our breath, hoping not to hit anybody, moving up and down these one lane roads, which are just lovely, but it was a little intimidating. (laughs) Let me tell you, a little different than our four lane roads everywhere here in Texas, where everything, of course, is bigger. But in Derbyshire, why did we choose Derbyshire? Okay, I'll tell you the, the real reason I chose Derbyshire, nothing to do with genealogy. It's because I'm a huge fan of Pride and Prejudice, the 1995 A&E version of Pride and Prejudice with Colin Firth and Jennifer Ely. I love that show. I've watched a zillion times, okay? And I always thought about the scene where Elizabeth Bennet is staying up on the tops of the peaks at Derbyshire and just overtaken with the beauty of the peaks there. And I thought, you know, I've been to England so many times, and I've never spent any time in Derbyshire. So that's what we decided to do. And it turned out that there are many wonderful manor houses and halls and palaces to go visit in that area. So uh, we hit seven of them. Uh, We stopped at Blenheim Palace on the way, uh, driving out of London. Of course, that's not in Derbyshire, but it's the home of Sir Winston Churchill. And it was kind of right on the freeway, uh, making our way north. So we stopped at Blenheim Palace, and that was fantastic and had tea there. And I'm a huge fan of Sir Winston Churchill and learned more about him and his family. And that was tremendous. Up in Derbyshire, we went to Chatsworth, which is probably the largest, most famous, certainly opulent. It's still privately owned, which is kind of impressive. Many of the homes are part of the National Trust in England. Chatsworth was on my radar because it was Jane Austen's inspiration for Mr. Darcy's home in Pride and Prejudice. Uh, Jane Austen had visited Derbyshire in her lifetime and and loved it. And so I had to see Chatsworth, which was really beautiful. Uh, That was very impressive and amazing grounds. And they were running all the fountains and it was just lovely. Then we went on to Lime House. I think it's Lime House, L-Y-M-E. And this was used for the exterior filming of Mr. Darcy's Pemberley in this TV show. And yeah, that's one of the reasons I picked it. But it was still a fantastic choice, even if you're not a big fan of Pride and Prejudice. It's a beautiful choice, a lovely home. And then we went to Sudbury, which was used for the interior filming of Pemberley. And I have to say, I was 
taken with the interiors. Of, uh, I can see why they chose it. It was gorgeous. And, you know, some of these homes, I want to say it was Chatsworth. I was amazed how opulent this one corridor was. And it was just room after room after room down a long corridor. And they explained that the family's greatest hope was to have the king and queen come and visit. And so they built this series of rooms down this whole side of the house. The first one being a reception room where if you wanted to um, be able to see the king when he was visiting, you would come to this room and you would kind of check in with his secretary and just stand there and hope and hope that maybe he would allow you to have an audience with him. And if you make that, then you get into the next room where you then wait and you kind of get assigned your your time or whatever to visit and have an audience with the king. And then there's the room you have the audience. And then there's the king's chambers beyond that and their closet beyond that. And the rooms get more and more spectacular. But the sad ending in that story was the king and queen never came to visit. I mean, they spent millions of pounds decorating every wall with priceless tapestries and glorious furniture. And they never came. You know, they say that you built it, they will come. They didn't come. (laughs) These poor people. (laughs) Oh, well, that's what, you know, maybe that's what happens when you're trying too hard. But (laughs) it was an interesting story. And it never occurred to me that they would never have actually received the king and queen there. I think that was actually at Chatsworth that that occurred. But Sudbury was the interior shots of Pride and Prejudice and Pemberley. We went to Haddon Hall, which, funny, had a connection to Pride and Prejudice. I guess it's just in my DNA to be able to track these things down. But I originally selected it to visit because one of our family's favorite movies was The Princess Bride. And that was filmed there along with many other things. And I was also very taken that they were going to have a well-known pianist from Russia who was going to play the pianoforte there at Haddon Hall in this really amazing, in its preservation, Tudor home. You know, we're talking 12th century. It was just a phenomenal how well kept it was that things were still in place and hadn't been torn down and destroyed over the centuries. So we got to hear him play. Of course, I took a picture of every piano in every house we visited. But it turned out that the dining hall at Padden Hall was actually used as the interior shots for Lizzie's stay in Lambton when she's out visiting Derbyshire with her aunt and uncle. They stay at Lambton and they stay at like a bed and breakfast. And these are her quarters. And this was the dining hall because of, I guess, the Tudor interior. So that was kind of a fun little coincidence. We made a quick stop at Kettleston Hall. Unexpected. It wasn't on my initial list, but it was well recommended by the folks at Dana Farm where we were staying. And we went to Calk House. And I'm I'm not going to go into it in this episode. I'm going to talk about it, I think, in, in the upcoming premium episode. Calk House was recommended by one of the gals serving breakfast at the bed and breakfast. And she said, oh, it's just cram packed full of stuff. And, you know, many of these homes were. They had so many amazing priceless possessions. So we said, okay, well, she seems excited. We'll go to it. It was not at all what we expected. And while at first I felt very disappointed, I realized there was a greater story there. And I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to telling you more about that story because I think it really ties in to many of the ideas and philosophies and concepts that we deal with in genealogy. So we'll just save that. Okay, we'll talk about that in our hopefully our next premium podcast episode this month in June 2019. So we took many long walks during that week along the peaks, the valleys, the streams that make up the absolutely breathtaking county of Derbyshire. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, If you're interested, if you ever go, go visit the wonderful folks, Joan and Martin over at Dana Farm. Um, It's dana.co.uk. I have no affiliation with them, except I love to recommend things to you that I think you'll really, really enjoy. And they are awfully nice folks and took very good care of us. Thank you to Kirsty Gray and her team for inviting me out to speak at the genealogy show. Okay, well, that's it again for episode 230. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you were inspired to maybe tell some of your own stories. And thank you to our sponsor for this episode, which was StoryWorth. That was just a very happy coincidence. This episode was already in the works um, because I'm so passionate and committed to um, encouraging you all to tell your stories. 
And they came along and said, oh, we'd love to be back on the show and help you with the the free podcast again. And they did. And how wonderful, because it really fits in with what we're talking about here. If you're still a little unsure about writing your stories, your memoirs, feeling a little timid about getting started, you know, StoryWorth takes a lot of the work out of the process because they're going to feed you the questions and you can do a little bit each week over a year and end up a really, really nice finished keepsake. So again, to take advantage of their offer, the perfect gift for Father's Day, you can get $20 off by visiting storyworth.com slash gems and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.